This meeting is being recorded. Got it. Yeah. So we so say welcome everybody. Do I start again? I don't turn it. Right. There but, you go. Yeah. Good. That right. There's lots of images. This one you'll forget about. My wife was away for a while. <laughs> A week, and this is part of the, the bits and pieces and family trees. It's not all of it by any means. And uh, I spent a week sorting it out, making it, making it into that compacted there. And there it sat uh, until, uh, oh yes, these are the people that pop up from all over the place. Uh, there's John Sprott in, uh, there's another one there underneath me, John Sprott, New Zealand. These ones from Oregon came across uh, an H sprout in a cemetery uh, near Arnhem. And a friend was in Valparaiso in Chile and came across a gravestone to Alexander Sprout. And uh, they're everywhere. Right, this is here because this was my lapel badge when I was doing surgery about 15 years ago, but uh, a few years before I retired rather imperious lady came in with a wee dug to see me in the surgery. She looked at my lapel badge. In fact, she caught a hold of it. The Sproot, what a funny name, she said. Are you from here? She said very pointedly, but uh, that's not a very good thing to ask. So um, I ignored that. And uh, I said, well, we're a local family. I've been here for 30 years and I've never heard the name before. So, madam, if you're out there, this talk is for you. <laughs> so, yeah. However, uh, what I will say is there's nothing different, special, or important, or unique about us. It's a less common name, so it's actually easier to find rather than Smiths and, and, or Jukits in our yes. ancient. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, another thing is that the main centre of the family all stayed in one place. We didn't sort of get up and move into another district, area, whatever, even within Dumfries and Galloway, we're in Borg. And uh, another thing is we have records, and they must have built up in the houses that we lived in. And uh, there's some history, although it's dispersed all over the place. I got some information, quite a lot of information from Australia, Canada, whatever. Another thing is that we're numerous children, Sprout children, and you'll see there, this is me as a scientist, birth rate is greater than mortality rate, so we're still going about. Uh, the family were recently well educated and they could write, and I'll come on to that in a wee while. And another, another thing which is quite useful, if you want to find out gravestones, they're all in one place, scenic, or mostly all. Um, but it's a real interest, and I, I find it really enjoyable. It beats doing crosswords. It beats doing Sudoku. I do this genealogy. And it's the social history that interests me. Um, I say it's a less common name, and this is just a random piece of information that came along. For instance, in 1774 and 5, presumably it's the same sailing trip because the boats were rather uh, slow then, there were several sprouts, three sprouts uh, down there that went to New York. A Thomas Sprout, who was a joiner, a Hugh Sprout, a farmer, a John Sprout, a laborer. I have no idea where they fit into the whole fabric of the thing, but they went. But I've got a, a census of Borough Parish. On it, there were 62 sprout individuals living in Borg, and there were 18 separate farms or households. But there were all sorts. There were carrier, there was a mason, domestic servants, farm servants, joiners, farmers, wives, and children, obviously. And But that was 18 different lots. Ten years later, the next census, the 1841 was the first census, national census. 1851, uh, there were 41 individuals on 12 separate farms or households. Uh, I would put that down rather than people moving in Scotland, probably lowland clearances. Uh, that's people just jumping on a boat and going. And there are certainly 
uh, probably people live, um, listening from the States here, that uh, their folks came over between 1841 and 1851. And in 2023, uh, there's only two individuals with this broad name, only one that was actually uh, born in Borg. So it's uh, been diminishing over the years. Uh, so I'll go right back to the origin. No matter where I get the information, there have been people doing the Sprout story, various people over the years, and I've got sort of the start of them. And they've all come up with the same, same stuff, but get writer's block after about two, two pages and give up. I've done a lot more, I'm afraid. Um, lots, sorry, there's lots on the board there, but uh, there is a sprout out in uh, Edmonton in Canada, or he's not a sprout, but he's from the sprouts, and he happens to be a genealogist, genealogist, and uh, he's done a lot of family Y-line DNA, and it's proven that we're actually Celtic, uh, with about 500 AD, our DNA originating in France and uh, Central Europe. So we came via Wales, didn't like the rugby, and came further <laughs> north. Yeah. There, um, with the genetic um, diversity, there's uh, some common DNA with William's families. So Who are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is for some people. Um, the late Sandy Sport always maintained he was from Viking stock. <laughs> Sorry, guys, no more pillaging. Uh, there's another theory that, uh, that, from, that we're related to Sprots, who own much of the land between the Tyne and the Keys. Um, there's quite a lot written about that in the family line before they got the writer's block. Um, and the, the, the supposition is that they drifted north to get away from the Normans and the Norman invasion. I don't go with that. Uh, some of the first evidence of Sprout name was about one bit, sorry, the, um, my picture of me is in front of some of the, the writing, but there was a Bishop Sprout who witnessed the Hollywood, uh, Holyrood Charter, and it's Edinburgh Holyrood in 1262. And uh, there's Ragnar's role was um, people had to uh, show fealty to uh, Balio, John Balio, um, at the behest of Edward Hammer of the Scots, as he called himself. And uh, so if you wanted to live, you signed that. And Hugh Sprock was from the earth, and he's actually signed the Ragnar's role. So, there's evidence that they came from around that. However, um, I haven't got everything here, but the sources of information, I've got lots of stuff from all over the place. From I've got, um, I've read a lot of books over the time uh, and managed to contact through all this family tree stuff and emails are brilliant. I've uh, got a lot of uh, people I now know, but never met mm -hmm. in various continents. Uh, internet trolls down at the bottom there. I don't pick up much from that. Up at the top, uh, you, I think there's uh, various letters mentioned. Uh, can go along to the Senate Kirkyard and read what it says there, but it's much better to sit in your armchair and go into kirkyards.go.uk. One thing I haven't done is actually sat down in a museum or a library and gone through old papers to me. That sounds dusty. Uh, Howard Sprout, he was from Chicago. He was, uh, among other things, he was in the uh, United States Air Force. He went over and visited um, Berlin in, in a bomber during the war. And he came back and he went into real estate in America, became very interested in, in uh, his genealogy and Howard, in actual fact, was awarded an honorary FSA for all his work. He sat there and must have spent hours and hours of work. You met him, David, and uh, 
he got his ownership of the fel uh, fellowship of the Society of Antiquarians. Yes, oh, for yeah. all the work he did. Yeah. So uh, he put all these books there. In fact, you'll find copies in the, the museum. And I think there's some in the York Library as well. Uh, it gives, I've got a copy of a lot of <laughs> the <laughs> census information. Uh, 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 now, this is, everybody has a eureka moment in their lives. If you don't, I hope you do. Uh, these are what we call the Canadian letters. Now, I was, uh, suddenly got an email from a guy called Paul Sprott from Canada. Uh, I've met some of his relatives who came over here to see the old country. And this was one of them. He's about the same age as I, I am. He was an educationalist over in Canada. And he said, I've got all these letters. What do I do with them? So <laughs> the, these are about 80 of these letters. They were kept for almost, a, a, almost 200 years in that box. MS stands for Marian Sproul. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were um, lovingly tre tre treasured there. And every so often somebody would pick them up and have read them and uh, say, oh, very interesting, whatever, and put a bit of sellotape on the torn bits and that would be it. But Paul came along and said, well, well I'll start to transcribe them. And he's transcribed them, it took him a while, and he sent them over to me. Uh, he's actually a fourth cousin of mine, mm -hmm. or maybe fifth cousin. It's, uh, and it took three years as he went through them all and emailed the, the transcribed letters over to me. I, one a month, two a month, three a month occasionally. And uh, it was amazing uh, what came, came through. It's hoped to have them published online sometime soon. That would be in a sort of free um, online way. Now, here's a copy of one of them. Uh, just a bit. Now, I don't know, I, I think pointing to the screen. Yeah, you start there. The farmers are all complaining loudly of bad times. Still their houses. You can't read the rest, unfortunately. So what's new? Okay, <laughs> um, that's what we've got. Now this is a cross-written letter. It's written one way, and then it's written the other way. And how on the earth Paul managed to do that with 80 letters, and some of them run for pages. Up there, right in the middle, you can read, um, sort of, you have to put your mind to it. It says Canadian, yeah. And uh, bad weather, yeah. So it took a long time. Some of the words he couldn't really get. So um, what I did was look at them and think, ah, I know who he's talking about. I know which farm. I mean, if you, somebody's written out Gigal, uh, G A I T G I L. And Paul transcribes what he sees, but he puts letters in the wrong place. It's quite intriguing, isn't it? Oh, that's legal. It's, uh, oh, here's here's uh, one out of a, a letter. It was from 18, oh, I can't see that, but it's 1824. Uh, we've had a very warm summer this year. Nothing like it remembered for these 30 years. We this week began our harvest. I see from the window where I'm writing, 20 sheathers and four binding the flats. I mean, most of the smakian is in barley, the most excellent crop, the only grain that pays well now. The rest of our crop is in the ram. Part of the ram with alum and Craigley is in green crops. Now, I'd just like to thank the people that did the Borg Field Names Project. Uh, it's not working. Mm -hmm. Next thing. Mm -hmm. That's it. Here's the um, board field names project. This is Bornness, which uh, the lady 
was talking from. It's my great-great-grandfather's sister, eldest sister, Margaret. She was sitting, looking out of the house at Bournemouth over the flats here. She was talking about the Smarkian, Craigley, and Allenfield being uh, these, are, these other three in Barlet and 24 people working in the flats there. It's, it's amazing social history. Uh, now we're going from here. That's it. So I'm going to start. I have to start somewhere. Well, I'm not starting that actually. This is the first record um, in the paper somewhere. This is how it came up uh, with this. It was John Sproat, born in 1520, in Brig House, or Bridge House, as it was called there. Uh, yeah, now Howard went from John Sproat up at the top and made up a family tree all the way down there to uh, Thomas Sproat there, who's marked at the bottom, uh, born 1724. Now, up above that, I don't have any of the gravestones. I don't know about that. I say I don't spend time in, in uh, libraries, whatever. I'm an outside person. But he's, he's got, um, Thomas brought above that, he's had two wives, and he's had a huge number of family. Now, with his second uh, wife, Elizabeth Johnson, he's... Uh, if you look at his, when his family were born from 715 right up to 1731, oh, I find that hard with his second wife that he's, he's been, she's been eating, breeding all that length of time. I definitely know that uh, the John S. Sprott, who's the second child to Thomas Sprott, uh, by DNA testing, his uh, descendants are not uh, related uh, there, from then. They're about 500 years before that. Oh, next, next slide. That's it. It's written in stone, I tend to believe it. Uh, this is uh, 1724. This is when uh, John Sproke was, uh, Thomas Sproke was born. He's uh, at that time, he was shown as a farmer in Brick House. So looking at his family, uh, I call this the bookended brothers because there were five of them in the family. There was Agnes, love the spelling of Agnes there, and Mary at the bottom end. John, uh, Thomas, and Hugh, that's the brothers. Uh, they uh, got married in succession. John to, uh, excuse me, Margaret Corey in South Park. Uh, Thomas to Mary Brown. Uh, I think she was from Borg. I can't trace that um, where she came from. And Hugh married another Corey, but Kearney Hill. And uh, yeah. yeah, this is where the origin of the Sprout spouses were. The, the father, Thomas, he's in the brown. He was, um, got, yeah, brown here, the father. He went as far as Balmangan for his wife. Uh, and the yellow, that was, that was where uh, John uh, got his wife from uh, South Park there next door. Uh, uh, the one that was used went to Renton, which is just out of Borg. He, he went for him. He's, uh, he married a cousin of the Corrie in South Park, who's Mary Corrie he married. And the daughter, uh, the end one, Mary, married a brown. I think she was out of... Um, sorry, she married... Um, Samuel Brown, he was shown as a farmer in Leith Borg, which at that time is uh, the early name for um, Borg House. 
what's known as Brighouse now. Anyway, here we are. This is the Brick House farm. Oh, IT problems and me saying so much good about them. Uh, this is Brick House, an aerial photo. It's a bit grainy because I was, uh, it's pre drones, got flying with my brother here's my, and uh, it rattles a lot. So you can see there the ruins of the old farm. I must find out when it was actually, the steading was actually built, but it looks as if it's been built in the square tight uh, to actually probably house dairies. So bits have been added on over the, over the year. Um, and one of the things that came down, oh, could we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I inherited from an aunt was a painting by Dorothy Nesbitt of Brick, brick House, Farmhouse, it was called. It was painted in, I think, in about 1930s. Uh, and it's taken from the angle of the Blue Arrow because you can see the, the distinct ins and outs of the house. That is the same house, to my mind and even down to the outhouse it's shown, but it's rather dilapidated, unfortunately. Next, please. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh -huh. So we're going to start with uh, John's Crook here. It's not all family trees, hopefully it's a bit more than that. He was a farmer, he went to Bournemouth he, in about 1830, and I can't find the date of marriage in any of the records. He married Margaret Corey. At, um, these are paintings that came from Australia. On the left, there's John and his wife, Margaret Corey. Um, oh, I was going to say handsome couple, but <laughs> yeah, they're of their time. Um, next please. Yeah, now we're talking about the Corries. This is an amazing story. Can I have that? No. No. Adam Corey here was a um, staunch Protestant and uh, he was actually farming on uh, Maxwell land with Tregelston. And his landlord is uh, of the, he was Catholic um, thing. And I think there was a bit of a, a to do in the church and Adam Corey stood his ground, at which point I think they would call it, um, yeah, the, I'll try to remember the name, but uh, I think the landlord uh, suggested that Adam should go, so off he went. And his sons went various directions. Uh, they actually went into other farms. One in, went into Barn Clue. Uh, one stayed at the eldest one stayed in Craigelstown, but this is his complete family here, uh, John and Adam. But the one that's of interest is William Corey. He started trading in uh, Scotch, what's called Scots goods. Now, that, from Scots goods, I would expect it to be things like woolen goods, possibly lace goods, mocklin wear, anything you can think of. And he started trading them down south into England. And he started to make a lot of money. He made his base in Wellingborough, which is in Northamptonshire, and he made a huge amount of money. He bought a lace factory there, and everything he touched. He must have had the Mid Midas touch because he, in 1779, he bought what's called Senec and Dunrod estates. Now, uh, the, when he's talking about uh, Dunrod here, he's actually it's a small place that's uh, near Kearney Hill and, uh, well, it's near a South Park. That is the Dun that Dunrod. And he made, I see, everything he touched turned to gold. And this, his, he, gave, he when he bought the estate, he put John, which is his next brother, into uh, South Park. 
and y- a younger one yet, he put into Kearney Hill, the two brothers staying there. However, this uh, fortune uh, was great. He took a lot of people. The people that are marked in pink were all associated, family people were associated with his business. As much as he was good at business, unfortunately, it wasn't very fortunate with his family. If you look there, I don't know if you can read it. Um, he had uh, six of a family. They all died young, apart from daughter Jane. Uh, to keep it in the family, the, uh, the eldest son of, the, of William Corey's older brother, Richard, married Jane. He married his cousin, but that... Uh, and it kept the inheritance, I suppose, in the family. But well, poor old Richard, who married Jane, he didn't last long either. He died relatively young. So Jane had the inheritance all the all this time up until she died in 1828. And the inheritance went, went to Adam, who was a brother of Margaret, who married John Sprope. Uh, the next uh, younger brother who went into Kearney Hill, Adam. one of his daughters, Adam, one of his daughters married Hugh Strode and went into Brenton. Right. <laughs> so, next please. Yeah. Now, there is Adam Corey and there is Penelope. Now, whether that, that looks like these photographs, uh, not photographs, these um, portraits actually look earlier than that, I would have said they are not sort of 1800, they might even be earlier than that, just clothing wise, but that's what I was told that they are. Uh, so we're back to them, John and Margaret, okay. And they had 11 children. Uh, next please. The first, uh, John and Adam emigrated to Canada as part of the Lowland Clearances. Why did they go and the others not go? Well, Thomas had died by that time, but uh, the, uh, a younger brother to John, William, stayed on to farm, but John and Adam went. Now, discovered that uh, somebody put me in touch with uh, Donald Tate, who'd come across the Nielsen letters, Nielsen being as in Back Nielsen and uh, Nielsen Memorial in Gatehouse and Nielsen Memorial in Balmaghi. And I'm not going into their story. It's an amazing story too. Uh, they, one of them had written a letter saying that John and Adam were coming over to Canada and uh, that they had lost their money from a cattle dealer named uh, McClellan. And uh, they, hadn't, they hadn't any money, so I thought I'd just jumped the next ship, went over to Upper Canada and some of the earlier pioneers over there. And that's where the Canadian letters come to. The younger one, Adam, he got all these letters that, that appeared over there and there. Fascinating story. Yes, Adam. Mm. Yes, that Adam there. Yeah. I'm sorry, there's a few Adams who can't help it. <laughs> uh, now, Adam and John made it in farming and did quite a lot. But uh, this is Alexander, who's the eldest, um, eldest son of Adam. He uh, was quite well educated. He went to university in Toronto and about the 1880s, uh, there was a, a rebellion. You think, think last of the Mohicans, there was an Indian rebellion. Uh, a Frenchman called Andrew, Andre Creel uh, tried to make all the uh, Indians in Can the Canadian provinces uh, rebel against their English masters and uh, they started to fight the British that were there. 
and Alexander was uh, became a colonel in the regiment there and went up to Prince Rupert. If he looked to see where Prince Rupert is, you wonder why they want to go up there. This is a fort. Uh, at night, they had to barricade the families in the church there because they were under attack. But however, Alexander's fort had a lot to do with putting the rebellion down. That's just a diversion. Uh, there's another. Anyway, yes, this is a map here of um, actually this place and that, that was um, written by in 1885, showing the plan of the of the fort, and there's a painting there of it mm -hmm. below. This is just another jolly Canadian scene as time went on. However, we're digressing from the sports of Borg here. The Thomas died early, age 20, and Mary, Isabella, and Penelope all died at an early age. There was quite a, um, and all of these died of tuberculosis. It just shows you the, the mortality rate here. Uh, okay. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is why I know Penelope died of uh, consumption said we we're a good deal more alarmed about Penelope. She's been ailing for about three months. She was seized with coughing and a spitting of blood and has, since has had frequent returns. She was by no means likely to get well from all these symptoms. We have good reason to dread consumption. Though the doctor assures us she will get well, he ascribes it to a great growth, he goes wrong. Uh, but that's the sort of text we're getting in these letters. To, it's just telling us as it is. Go ahead next, please. Uh, and Isabella actually has uh, three children, or I'm sure this is the case, but there, through the letters, I started to read all about William and Tom. They both became ship's captain. And there was a daughter as well. She died of TB in Edinburgh. And there's also graphic accounts of her demise. She was, uh, when her mum died, she was brought up by her father and spent quite a lot of time at Bournemouth too. Uh, okay. Now this is the thing that intrigues me. These sisters, the other sisters, Margaret Jane and, well, there's Penelope there, she, but she was there for a while. They seem to run, run a boarding and dressmaking business. Uh, 112 George Street in Edinburgh, which I would have thought was a pretty prestigious uh, address at that time, and a boarding establishment. You talk about uh, the quality going to the country in the summer, so the dressmaking business was a bit quieter, and I think the boarders had gone out to, to their various estates there, so it was quite an upmarket place. But that uh, sort of fell apart uh, later on. Yeah, the youngest Elizabeth, now she doesn't appear in the gravestone, but there's um, stories about her here that uh, she actually wrote a letter in 1821 to her brother Hugh. And uh, I believe she's sometimes employed by the Royal family and she got 30, 30 pounds, which is pretty good for the first year. And she's promised more. So she worked out and about. So it's next piece. And this is the one that really floats my boat. And he was, I knew he was a, a sailor or a captain of a ship, this Hugh, if you could go please. And the letters are written. He was, um, he appears first in uh, his uh, 1824, Calcutta, his, these various places and he's written, or people have talked about him. But from 1824 to 1828, he served a, a four years uh, apprenticeship on a boat uh, out of Liverpool. It was captained by Captain Brown. The ship's name was Perseverance or Perseverance, and it was run by a firm called Brocklebanks. 
who ran a, a, quite a lot of ships out of Liverpool. They were originally from Whitehaven. Now, I know he didn't go on until 1829 because the ship foundered off Madras in 1829 and he wasn't there. Uh, there's no story of it at all in the letters. Uh, he's next found on uh, a ship uh, called the Diva. I don't know where he went from the Perseverance until he appeared in the Diva, and that was run. Um, that ship was owned by a chap called Mr. Morris from Aberdeen. In 1847, he writes to say that uh, he's waiting for his ship to be completed, but he can't get carpenters just now, and it's uh, the ship's taking a lot longer to be built. Uh, not as bad as some ferries elsewhere, but never mind. Uh, in, so he's, he goes on the Phoenician, and now it's owned by uh, George Thompson Jr., it's called JTG. Now, JTG in Aberdeen for um, he eventually calls his, his uh, shipping line the White Star Line. And uh, he's on three ships, the Phoenician, the Walter Hood, and the Star of Peace at different times. Yeah. Pass it on to me. Yeah. Cool. This is the Brig Diva. It was owned by Mr. Morris Aberdeen, I found that. Um, somewhere. Uh, it was built in the east coast of, I think it was Whitney or somewhere in 1838. Okay. Now this is a letter, again cross-written, from Hugh, a captain from Calau, which is port of Lima in Peru. It says, I embrace the opportunity of the bark Zoe sailing to Liverpool to let you know how, how evil was it. I'm getting on in the first. Uh, he, how captains the time there, he was actually owned, I can't remember exactly the number there, but he owned a certain proportion of the ship. Uh, one of the things was like, uh, if you go into company, you're given so many shares, uh, in, in lieu of salary, well, Hugh had so many 64ths of a ship. Why it was proportions of 64ths, I don't know, but he had quite a few, quite a few of them, so he was a co-partner in the thing. Really? One of the things, hmm? yeah, one of the things that uh, the ship's captains couldn't do, they couldn't ensure their share they couldn't ensure what belonged to them. And this was to make sure that they stayed in their ship. If their ship started to go down, they would do everything in their power to say it was actually illegal for the captains to... Uh, Another way that they, they made money, and uh, he talks on this in the letter, was uh, he sell, he's trying to sell some goods that his sisters have given to him, including dresses and shoes, the ladies' shoes. But he said it's, he's having a pretty bad time with that because the, um, the Chileans' ladies, their shoe sizes were far too small and much smaller than the, <laughs> the, uh, what they'd given them. Given in, however, uh, on the next one. Now, his uh, White Star commands, when he went in from 1847, he was on the Phoenician. It was uh, made record trips. I think it came back at that time in something like seven, no, it was just over 80 days from Australia. And he was also. Uh, the captain when he brought back the first commercial cargo of gold from Australia. That was the time, 1851, two, three, that uh, the gold fields opened up there. One of the problems the captains had, and they had to be really uh, 
strong about it was they had to keep their crew for the trip back because uh, the gold fields were so tempting and there were many ships that were left there stranded. They couldn't find crew. They'd all jumped overboard, gone off to the gold fields. However, he managed that. Uh, his next uh, one thing, it seems to be that Hugh was a sort of test pilot for the ships. Walter Hood was built, the same as Nation and Star of Peace, in the Walter Hood's yard in Aberdeen. And he took him on their maiden voyages. So I think if uh, he'd been around when Concord was around, he'd have been a test pilot. He, that's, he was up there with him. Uh, there's a bit there that says, Captain Snopes brought remark, her sailing qualities may be judged from the fact of having run during four several days, 320 miles each for 24 hours. Now that's running at uh, 13 and a half, 14 knots, which is, I've only once exceeded that in a sailing boat and that was in a trimaran a racing. <laughs> it's by a serious uh, speed for these times. And on his star of peace, that did even more. He went, it was sub 80 days uh, and four consecutive trips. In 1858, he retired. He was born in 1807, so he was only 50, 51 when he retired. So early retirement, but I think he was uh, ill because five years later he died. And his legacy was a stamp of uh, showing the Phoenician. The White Star lines actually were all, the hulls were all bottle green and the part of very fine looking ships. Next please. Uh, that's a picture of uh, a portrait of Hugh there. Apparently he brought no nonsense. He was uh, fair but stern. And that's a star of peace. That's a Montague Dawson painting that was done in the 1930s. This is our direct ancestor. He farmed Bournemouth from when his father died in 1820. Took over. Next, please. Now, this uh, was annotated in some of the photographs I taught. Uh, I got William Sprott on his horse. Now, does anybody know actually where that is? Well, it says Cutlery Bob. Yeah, you've read it. Uh, in the background, behind that man's hat is uh, Borg Academy, or Borg School, as it's known. Uh, and that's just uh, near the Kirk there. And that is purported to be my great great grandfather, uh, which it looks more like in the mutton shop. Um, uh, sideburns, but with the dress, I think it's later actually. I think that would be my great grandfather. Oops, please. Now, William married Jane McGill in uh, here, and uh, she was had family uh, descended from William Douglas, James Heron. A uh, few people are not going to that. To her family, her she had one brother went to Ararat in uh, it's a small place in Victorian Australia. She had another one was a master mariner as well, and he was with Brocklebanks, and uh, he became a shipping agent uh, there. Another um, one continued in the family farm of Bursala. Another brother went to farm in Torrery at Southwark, and yet another one. Uh, that's it. He was. He went. To, uh, oh no, it's uh, yeah, John McGill Bersalif. Yeah, that's him. I don't know what happened to Andrew McGill. <laughs> that, that's uh, the family anyway. But it's interesting that uh, one went off to Australia. Another one went to. Uh, to uh, maritime world. Next, please. 
So with the previous generation, the unmarried um, fairly close, how come she married? Does anybody know the answer to that? Why go on that, go on that wee bit further, actually into Wigtonshire to find a wife? Well, uh, I'll tell you that what I think is the answer, the next slide is Borg Academy again. Uh, next, please. It was, it was, uh, well, it was finally before that, but it was actually became an academy in 1803. It was endowed by a chap called Thomas Rainey, who had been at the school once upon a time. And in 1805, it apparently had 178 pupils. Uh, it probably is in the primary school and just got a handful, I don't know what more including boarders from Wigtonshire and across the Solway. And I know that there was a McGill on the roll, or at least two McGills there, although I haven't gone into the books. And I think this is probably the, the reason is the boarders could either be boarded out in the different farms, but however, uh, William must have met uh, Jane McGill. Come off, yeah. Just, yeah, that's it. So that's my idea. Now, there's a period of um, mid call stability in Borg from 1803 to 1843. It was the same um, headmaster, William Poole. He was appointed by the church as they were uh, in these days. And uh, he was actually a graduate, and they had requested that a graduate um, go there, and I think the standards were kept up, which was one reason that all his sprouts, Hugh and William and their siblings were all fairly literate. One thing in these letters there wasn't, there was never a letter from the mother. There was always, you know, mother sends greetings or whatever. I don't think she could write, or probably well enough. Next week. And this is an interesting thing. Navigation was always also taught here. Is this because uh, why Hugh decided to go to sea? Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, this, this again, an interesting thing. It was my father actually um, told me about that. He didn't tell me all that many stories about uh, the family. But here's a wee story. It says, uh, on my return from, that's him sitting, that's his wife, Jane McGill, uh, deciding who the rest are, I haven't a clue. Uh, on my return from Inverness, I took Alexander and called him Mr. Morris. So he's gone via Aberdeen to see Mr. Morris, who was the... The uh, corner of the ship that Hugh was on. And uh, so he's inquiring kindly for you. Why was William in Inverness? I'll tell you why it was in Inverness. This is the earliest I've got of the record. But uh, to cut his long story short, the sheep in Galloway were rather poor quality. There were uh, nothing much went commercial. So the Galloway farmer went over to the borders to buy them. Unfortunately, the border sheep was absolutely full of scraping, which might have helped with um, sort of a uh, similar sort of thing to mad cow disease, but in sheep. However, uh, the, so William here went north. He went to Aberdeen and he was actually buying sheep. There is a, an entry uh, where he talks about Patrick Seller, now, Patrick Seller, you might have heard the name, Highland Clearances, yeah, he was a factor for Duke of Sutherland, and it might have been, uh, it wouldn't have been him because he died by then, but it must have been, a, maybe been a relation. So he went up every year and brought sheep back from Inverness, Laird and Rogart. He went to what's called the Inverness Wool Fair, he went every year. His son 
also William, but William T, or W. T, as he was called, his son went an unbroken 50 years to the Inverness Wolf Fair to buy sheep. And he brought them down initially, and they were driven down by drovers. Teams of drovers would bring them down, and he uh, procured them for farmers in uh, Kirkubishire and Wigtonshire. Uh, there's this, uh, I've uh, seen another letter from something that randomly came my way from somebody else that uh, talks about their relative having gone up to uh, up the west coast by steamer on his way to Inverness. So this might have been, I don't know how he, he got there, how he came back, but I should imagine he'd go by coach because that's next to him. I, I don't know if it goes on transport, I rather doubt it, but I think it was a coat. That's how I think my wife killed me showing that. That's um, our great grandfather was the blacksmith <laughs> in the middle. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, William seemed to really stick into his uh, farming. As early as 1837, he got prizes for Galway cattle, and he was a judge for them in 1844. These are times when the, the Highland Show uh, went all over Scotland and different places at different times. For instance, his uh, William's grandson, my grandfather, actually went in for Ness to pick up a prize in 1837, I think it was. And he also um, seemed to be well enough known. He gave a evidence to all society on the law of hypothetic. No, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, Thomas Stroke was the next brother. He's in Brickhouse. Um, died in 1814. Yeah, please. Uh, first, we come across him was a, a little snippet from uh, a book that said Thomas Sproat was dragged out of a house in Kirkcubri, thrown into the river and pelted with stones. There were three ladies, uh, well, I think there were more in the group, but three women were picking up, uh, were picked up for having done this. Uh, this was food riots when uh, the population thought that the food was too expensive, they would pinch it, but sell it at what they thought was a fair price and give the money back to who mm -hmm. it belonged to. But they got a wee bit carried away. And, uh, and it was actually somebody from Cumston End that they were after, <laughs> <laughs> mistaken their identity. Uh, next please. Now, Thomas had uh, three sons. The eldest is interesting. He uh, was meant to go into the church, and the story was that he'd gone to university, but suddenly decided he would go on the grand tour. First turned up in, uh, was a mention of him, Italy to begin with. Then in the Holy Land, uh, then another letter talks of about him being in Egypt. I think he took a wrong turn and ended up in Australia. This guy did really well and made a lot of money. Uh, Alexander stayed in Brick House and another one went with his elder brother to Australia. He was a doctor there in Melbourne. This is Thomas here. In 1853, it talks of uh, Tom uh, employing a number of diggers, employed on the gold fields, and owning 2,000 acres of land beside Gilo. I've discovered, um, having gone into various records from Australia, that he actually squatted in 2,000 acres and was able to buy them because he was squatting on them. Uh, 
uh, correct price and he returned home according to one of the letter with an annual pension of 10,000 pounds. Now, you go in 1853 and do a conversion there and you'll see how many millions it was worth. Um, yeah, however, they both came back. They wanted to come back and see the mother who was ailing, but uh, they were too late. They were a year too late. Uh, and both Tom and Dr. John came back. Uh, and uh, it talks about Brig House. That's Alexander who stayed in the farm, having his second son, Gilbert, with him just there. Gilbert was a young man about to convent, commence business in his own account as a ship broker. And his uncle, Tom, he said, made a bit of money in the gold and uh, he purchased a 46 foot schooner for him. Uh, that is not a schooner, George. Yeah, okay. But it's a picture of a ship about that age. Uh, next. Uh, this is a grainy picture, but Gila, they're Geelong there, and uh, the area where he had was out in that peninsula. It's a natural harbour there. Uh, for Melbourne, uh, Geelong's just in that little indentation I have to the west, and uh, where Tom uh, had his land was there. He made a lot of money on his real estate, but he kept it uh, over there, his money over there. When he came back, he probably smuggled it back. Yeah. Now, this is where it gets really funny. Because Alexander that stayed on in Brick House, uh, there's a story here about uh, the distemp. He had uh, in 1841, Alexander had rinderpest. Oh, sorry, distemper among his cattle. Now I don't know if this was rinderpest, which is now stamped out worldwide, or it was foot and mouth disease. But anyway, um, Alexander. Uh, has tarred his animals to try and prevent it, but uh, such as life, it don't work. So, however, he was talking about, um, if you look there, Gilbert, who's the second son of Alexander, was in London. Um, he was actually educated, born at uh, Brighouse. He was educated in apparently done priests as well as public academy. And he was the explorer, Gilbert Markham's Sprott, who went over to Vancouver Island and was one of the few people I think was who was sympathetic to the plight of the Canadian First Nation population or native Indians, as you might call them, were called in these days. Uh, <clears throat> Now, I think that Alexander was struck for money because it was a court case, and I can't get my head around it, that um, he'd, I think he was owed a certain amount, um, he was going to be given a certain amount by Tom of the gold. And, oh, it's just totally confusing, but it's, I've actually read it on the internet, and wow, it's, uh, there's about four people involved, and two died before the case was, was uh, finished. Uh, Tom had died as well. So Alexander is reported of having been to Australia to try and get the money from Australia, which I think actually happened because he disappeared and went to live in London. He actually died in London in 1877. His, uh, so he must have gone uh, with it down there. And that's where Gilbert Malcolm Sprott was married. And that was his base originally. However, he, he, Gilbert Malcolm, the explorer, uh, Sprott Lake in Vancouver Island is named after him. Yeah, please. But this is an interesting thing, and David uh, over there will be quite interested in that one of the letters talk says Margaret, which is Adam's eldest sister, says the harbour at Brickhouse Bay is again revived 
it's the thought likely to go on next spring. Sandy Sprott is in quite a hurry about it. He's been trying to purchase a pleasure boat, whether in the face of a key or not, I will not say. Another letter in 1828 uh, suggests that he's definitely finished. The key in Brickhouse Bay seems to stand the winter storms quite well and is a safe harbour. But Alexander eventually got his, uh, his boat now uh, in 1840. And that was before, I think, he was strapped for cash. And that's probably why he was strapped for cash. cash he bought a 64-foot, two-masted schooner. It was named Hectorine. His wife was an Arcadian. Her name was Hectorina. And I wonder how his wife happened to be. Be there, an Arcadian lady, but I think quite a lot of Arcadians disappeared south. A lot of them became um, went into domestic servant service, and that might be where I met her. Next, so just on the subject of uh, Brickhouse Bay, again an aerial photograph. The house there on the right is uh, the one on the very right there. One big one, that one is Rockville. I don't know when that was built, but uh, the, you can see the pier on the right hand photograph. Do you see the semicircle beyond the pier? That was the second pier, so it looked much bigger way back when. Uh, that has been taken out. The second one, thankfully, still stands. That was, that's a uh, cousin of uh, my late father, Kenneth Bigger. He, um, he and his family stayed at Rockville in the summer sometime. And this is uh, him here. You can see the second pier. So it was still there about 1920. Uh, boat that's there, that big boat there, I think is there. Is the Jinty. It was around when I was born, like, um, when I um, early days at Brig House. Okay. John the Doctor in Australia, he seemed to keep house uh, for any Galavidian that uh, came past uh, Melbourne. And he talked, the McGill that he uh, talked about there is uh, would be uh, the brother that went out to Ararat. And uh, he saw doctors brought there, and he keeps open house for all Galavidians. But Thomas Strope, he doesn't mention. So being a doctor in Melbourne these days was obviously paid. Okay. And uh, I think that, that'll in there. Yeah. The, yeah, the, that family there, uh, there was two sisters, didn't marry. Uh, Thomas uh, Alexander, he never married. Gilbert did marry, but he, when he, he went out to Canada, spent his, his twilight years out in Canada and died there. His wife was left back home. I don't think they got on that well. So, and I think there was a son, but I don't know anything of the family there. So, to all the extensive purposes, the older ones there went to Clock and Dolly. Uh, yeah, there's too much written on this slide here, but uh, I say that line died out, Alexander's line, and the lease was continued by uh, my great, great, yeah, my great grandfather, William Thomas. And uh, William Thomas, his youngest son, actually married. When he went to marry, he went to live in Brick House. Uh, and his son, the late Sandy, moved into Rockville rather than the Brick House house, which is uh, now full of trees. But quite a lot of the time, Rockville was either it was nobody in there or it was rented out. And one of the summer tenants was Edwin. Edward, Edward Atkinson Horner, better known as the artist, uh, Broughton House, etc. 
and my great grandfather has got um, journals. And down at the bottom there is the entry there, friend of Rockville to M Mrs. E. Horner. Or Miss yes. Messer. Hmm? Yeah. So, he, yeah. Miss, Miss, yeah. yeah. And he uh, rented it for six weeks in 1905 and for twice that length of time, three months in uh, 1906. And that was where he painted uh, the girls in the flats. Uh, right to that time, I was. Uh, finishing here, but I want to talk about Hughes Probe quickly. I'll just gloss over it. Hughes Probe, uh, when he was young brother, he went to, to um, the farm in uh, Gerson. He married Mary Corey from Kearney Hill. A uh, big long thing here, it's quite a number of family, but the, several of them died of TB. And Hugh was a great letter writer, and he was a great friend of Adam that went over to Canada. And he talks of his brother James, yeah, he's uh, down at the bottom, he says, um, you have lost two sisters, and we have lost a father and three brothers. They should teach us that this is not our place of abode, and that we should be prepared to meet the bridegroom at whatever hour he may come. Uh, very point. So, yeah, um, Hugh, one of the things he wrote, now, some of the historians here might be interested to, you included, to read this. It would amuse you much to see Jay Taggart's publication. Now, this is the Scottish Galavidian Encyclopedia written by John McTaggart in 18, uh, yeah, 1824. Uh, the poetry is not pretty good. Stories are thought very ancient, but some of them very rough. He is very severe upon characters. Concretin gets a trubbing. Hamilton, the minister, very bad. And Mrs. Campbell is also cast very ill. I hear her son is threatening to shoot him. <laughs> so that, that was uh, quite an interesting part out of one of the Canadian writers. Uh, too complicated here. But Hugh and Mary, um, one of the eldest son here, um, I say three of them died. Uh, he continued to farm in, in uh, Renton. Hugh took over the lease of Lennox Plumpton, uh, which is neighboring, it's in Borg, neighboring to Renton. And he had uh, six sons and a daughter. The youngest was Robert, but Hugh went swimming in 1847 and drowned. I don't know the circumstances of that, but I think I'll have to try and find a newspaper and find if there's any report of it. But uh, very sad at uh, age 45, leaving six sons and a daughter. The younger, youngest, uh, I don't know what happened to the other ones, but the youngest, uh, Robert. Uh, again, too complicated. He uh, married Elizabeth McMillan from next door, Margaret. Some of her brothers had emigrated to Idaho. Uh, but long story short, then, Andy Little was one of several sons to a tenant farmer in Salefoot at Moffat. And father said to son, and I'll stay here, you know, you'll have to go. I've got a letter of introduction to a farm in Idaho for you. And here, have a score of sheep and two dogs. Make your way to Glasgow, sell them, jump on the boat and find your way to Idaho. So he actually did that. And uh, he had $2 left in his pocket by the time he got to the railhead and walked up. Uh, to the farm in uh, this. No, Emmet, I, um, in uh, Idaho. However, uh, he started share farming with others. He was uh, hired as a, a shepherd and uh, he got on great. He sold one of his dogs 
and left with this one dog that was really great and he did very well. He started share farming with a few people, started becoming quite uh, successful. Heard his father was died, so came back across the Atlantic and in a way to give a, uh, a way to give a parcel to uh, Robert Sprott here. He met Robert Sprott's daughter. And uh, one thing is love at first sight, according to the book. And uh, so long story short, he asked Addis, the eldest daughter here, to marry him. And he said, well, you might as well all come over the Atlantic. So the whole family, up sticks, apart from one, Mary Sprott, who married George Campbell, or William Campbell, who was a farmer in High Park. Uh, the Mary Sprott and the, the, um, their, their, uh, the, the, their progeny um, travel far. Parkers are related to them, among other things. Cam, yeah. So Andy Little became the largest sheep farmer in Idaho, in fact, in the United States, running 100,000 Jews. Now, I think 1,000 Jews would be enough, but, oh, yeah. And his shepherds came from the Basque country. He brought them over because they were used to staying out in the country in the high the high ground there, and uh, they were used to dealing with wolves and whatever came their way. Uh, thus, the country music you hear over in Idaho is partly because of them importing shepherds. That is a book uh, that was written about Andy Little and the Stroke family. Okay, uh, so my, um, when they emigrated, I think it was 1903, my grandfather took over the lease. He came back from the Second Boer War. So he continued the lease. So there was Sprott still continuing the lease. And uh, my, yeah, and uh, I came across, or well, I was uh, given this as another bit of memorabilia, JBS from EMU, that's John Barber's quote from Elizabeth Murray Usher to Mark Association uh, of our families on Cali Estate from 1763 to 1945. So that's 182 years the Sprouts were leasing land from Mrs. Mariusha. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mary Sprout, the only thing really there. Uh, once, yeah, just badge on. One, one of um, the eldest son went to Upper Canada and followed his cousin. He was called Sonny. Another one's a bank clerk in Castle Douglas, and two other sons uh, went away. Um, they ended up in not Mullach, I think, in time there. Um, I think it's getting a stage where, yeah, I must uh, stop. But this is a family of WG Sprout. There's some nice pictures. If you show the next one, uh, we'll stop on that. These are uh, daughters of my. Great, great uh, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll be asking questions about this after. I hope you'll stay with Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I just have to stop here running today. Thank you.